Hey, there's me. Okay. Huh. I turned mine on and all it did was change the size of my picture. That is what you get. I'm not allowed a lower third. No lower third for you. Nope. Okay. Yeah. I'm Fraser. She's a mystery. Um, so this is, I think, the last episode we're going to do is the old way, which is the, the hangout way. Yeah. Uh, just because... Uh, the technologies just a lot of are slowly failing. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's anyway. It's clear that this is sort of uh, not going to be the road of the future. So, yeah. But we've got a whole new technology. We've got Wirecast going. We did it with the weekly space hangout with mixed results last week, but we learned a pile of lessons, which we okay. we have learned from. So we should have that fixed for this week. Okay. So I just got back from a week in uh, Banff, Jasper, Rocky Mountains. Driving around the Icefields Parkway. Man, it is so beautiful there. We saw six bears, uh, five black, black grizzly. Well, five black and one grizzly bear. And, uh, and all of them were just munching greens at the side of the road. Apparently, your volume's a little low. Yeah, I'm making my mic taller. Did that help? It's, it helped for me. Uh, you're in. You're on campus today, so yeah. I may switch for astronomy cast then part two for today if this doesn't work ideally. Oh, poor campus! You're having to share internet with about a bajillion people, so. Or my yeah. husband at home, who's almost a bazillion people. When you look at how many windows he opens. I, I'm about to get two more screens, I think, so that I can properly handle broadcasting this show so that we can get all of the source material. Like, we had a great time last week. We were able to bring in photos and videos and YouTube streams and and switch between people and have two people side by side and then have inset pictures and, and lower thirds. So it's, it's very complicated, but it's going to give us a lot of stuff, but it requires just a mountain of screen space so that you can like, this is what we're seeing is the output. And this is all the inputs coming in. And Chad was sitting right beside me furiously trying to switch screens and make everything go. So uh, we have to just do the show quickly on this part, but it's going to be an action packed day today. If you're, if you're into it, uh, we're going to do this episode of astronomy cast. Then we're going to do the weekly space hangout at noon proper time. And then we're going to come back around and we're going to do another episode of astronomy cast. So we're going to do episode four thirteen now navigating near, and then we're going to do weekly space hangout. And then we're going to do episode four fourteen navigating far in, uh, in, I don't know, two thirty. I think so. It'll be like an hour after we wrap up the space hangout <laughs> and then, yeah. And then I think the goal is that we will eventually compress them all, compress the two shows. So we'll do, and I haven't figured out, I think I like to do the space hangout first, then astronomy cast so that we can kind of get the technology all warmed up. But, yeah. but the other way around is, is fine too. Um, okay. I'm, I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go? I'm going to yawn too much. I'm sorry. Oh, are you under caffeinated? I'm. I can't imagine how, but yeah, I have a super elderly dog who gets me up at 3 a.m. when she needs more painkillers. Oh. And and once she has the new painkillers, she's fine. But it takes like an hour for everything to kick in. So I I think I'm sleeping like a new mother with an elderly dog. Yeah. Dogs are, I, I have learned this never being a dog owner, but then merging families uh, with my wife, she has uh, two dogs and they're, you know, they're older dogs. They're both about 10, but it's still a level of mayhem that I had just never expected. It, they are children. They are as, that never grow up. So, um like going for a walk and you have to like consider the interactions of your dog with other people's dogs. It's, <laughs> it, I still, I still don't understand. 
She's like, no, can't you see that that dog is feeling concerned about this dog and that dog wants it. That's a very happy dog. I'm like, how can you tell the difference? So body language. It's all body language. I, I just, I don't see it. I don't get it. All right. I'm going to say hi to a bunch of people and then we'll do the show. So hi to Bruno Blakeland, Ilad Avrin, Guido Bibra, Helga Gurkog, Michael Thompson, Nancy Graziano, and others. Um, but those are the people who said hi to me, so that's what you get. Um, all right. Let us do this thing we like to call a show. I'm going to press record. Oh, yes. That's a thing. I pressed record. It's recording. I'm recording. Hooray. Hi, I'm Preston. also recording. Hello, Preston. Uh, for a few more weeks. Hello, that's Preston. True. Uh, okay. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 413, Navigating Near. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I'm doing well. A, a bit more than sleepy. Uh, we just finished a two-day all-hands meeting for CosmoQuest, where we brought in all the new people for our funding, um, and then got home to a sick dog. So it's like, I've gone three days without enough sleep, actually much longer than that. So this is going to be the sleepy Pamela episode, so please be kind. Oh, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just got back from, uh, no, yeah, no, the tough questions got to come. They, it's got to happen. I, I've, I have no, yeah, I have no sympathy, no mercy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just got back from a week long trip in Banff Jasper. And if you've never been to that part of the world, I highly recommend it. It was, it's just, it's so great. It's unbelievable. What a beautiful, beautiful place, man. I, I like road trips. Here we go. So it's hard enough finding your way around planet Earth. But what do you do when you're trying to find your way around the solar system? There's three dimensions. Today we're going to talk about how spacecraft navigate from world to world. And next episode, we're going to talk about how they get from star to star. In the future. Uh, in, the, in the future, how it will happen. Uh, okay, cool. So Pamela, let's, let's just start and talk about, a bit about sort of what methods we use to just navigate here on, on planet Earth. And then why we can't scale that up so easily. Well, once upon a time, it was simple. You said, there's a tree over there on a hill, there's a mountain over there, and back behind me, I see the ocean. I'm going to orient between these different things. And while you might sometimes screw up because you misjudged your distance to the tree, you generally knew where you were in the grand scheme of your small area. Uh, as people's worlds got bigger, as they explored further and further across land, it became a matter of, I know the sun sets in the east, or rises in the east, I know the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And we could get our basic directions off of the stars and the sun with enough guesstimates on time that we could handle things like the Mediterranean. Now, when people started trying to travel across the ocean, we had to then so solve the time problem. Uh, travel this far across this completely blank ocean for this amount of time, look at what the stars look like at a given time, and you could figure out where you were north, south, east, and west. Right, and that was a huge, huge challenge that knowing where you are north and south is, is relatively straightforward. You just look at the, the stars and you can tell where you are. Knowing where you were uh, east to west, as you said, took took a really, really precise clock. And is a there's a sort of a wonderful story about that about the the was it the uh, chronograph, yes. the latitude prize, yes. um, oh, the longitude prize. Sorry, amazing story. Um, there was a oh, did you ever see it? There was this great uh, television special. No, I'm not I sure didn't. who did it. It sort of covered the whole story of the Longitude Prize. So, sure. so it's totally worth going out. Uh, Dava Sobel did a book on it. Go read her book. Um, but here on Earth, basically, if we can figure out north, south, east, west, we're confined to a surface. So we're only moving really in two dimensions. So we only need to know where we are along that north and south and that east and west. And we're good. 
But when you get out into outer space or when you add the third dimension on the surface of the planet, you suddenly need something else. So GPS actually here on the surface of the planet, if you have a good GPS connection, it will tell you how many stories up in a building you are. You need that extra thing in space helping to nail down your position in that extra axis of movement. Although it's still clocks. Which it's, is kind of fun, right? It is. But here, now you're measuring how long it took between when that signal was released from a couple of different spacecraft to when you received it. Because all those different time lags tell you, oh, it was less lag to this spacecraft, more to that spacecraft. Now I know my distance from these three spacecraft. Now I know how high above the surface of the planet I am. Right. And so your, uh, your GPS device is just listening to all of these signals. It locks onto as many GPS satellites as it can, and then looks at the time codes from every single one of these satellites and then figures and then calculates its position in three dimensions mapped onto the two dimensional surface of, of planet earth and tells you where you are. And as you said, you get your altitude as, as well. <clears throat> so, this is all great. Thanks, GPS. We've got this great system for navigating ourselves on, on planet Earth. So once we get up into space, how does it get weirder and harder? Well, so here on the surface of the planet, we're, we're only really worried about three dimensions, up, down, left, right, uh, side to side, or north, south, east, west, and altitude above the surface of the planet to measure your position or to lock in your position in three dimensions, you need three measurements. We nailed that. Problem with the solar system is you now have to add a fourth dimension of time because the planets are constantly moving. Right. So, but I'm just trying to think about it. Like, so if you were like say you had some spacecraft and I'm just sort of thinking how I would just go about it is that I would somehow have a bunch of either signal receivers or cameras on it that were looking for the positions of, I guess, the signal on earth, the signal of, or at least a way to tell where the positions of the planets are, where the stars are. But I mean, so they're not, things aren't going to move very quickly when you're out deep in space. So how, how do they do this? Well, we're not going too deep in space yet. We're staying within our own solar system. Right. And so the stars aren't going to move. They're all going to be in their same positions. So, and it's not like you're calculating when they rise and set. So, so to first order, you figure out how far you are away from the surface of the planet Earth. And we can do this using the deep space network. We send a signal out to the spacecraft. The spacecraft sends an AOK -okay back or moral equivalent. And we measure the transition time that it takes from message sent to message received that tells us where it is and it can do something very similar to figure out where we are so now it knows its distance from the receiver on earth right but and distance that doesn't tell you position it just tells it, you distance well it it tells you that you're on a surface of a sphere that is centered on that point that was sending out the signal. So you've now confined yourself to the surface of this sphere. Now, once you've confined yourself to the surface of the sphere, that helps. Now, the next thing that the spacecraft will do is uh, quite often they can take pictures of the bright stars and figure out relative to the bright stars, okay, so I know now know where I'm oriented relative to that other sphere and between these two different things you can figure out exactly where you are on that surface so you get your distance from the earth and then you figure out where you are on that sphere by looking at the stars and figuring out your orientation relative to the stars and so you so you you've got this calculation and so imagine it's, but it's an imaginary sphere it's not necessarily your orbit it's like a it's it's, it's a crystal sphere. It's an it's an imaginary sphere that your that your spacecraft is on for this moment, and you also know the orientation of the spacecraft. Exactly. Now, all this tells you is the where. It doesn't tell you the how fast bit, which is something that really matters when a spacecraft is in motion. Yeah, and so, just sorry, just to go back to sort of nautical terms, right? Knots, right? They that was the way they used to calculate their their distance, their position was that they would put a rope out behind the 
the uh, their ship, they would tie a bunch of knots on, and that would tell them how fast the ship was going, depending on how many knots were were poking up above the water. And then they would calculate. So they'd say, we, we traveled in this direction for at 30 knots for 17 hours, and so we're pretty sure we're, a, we're at about this position. But it was it was a pretty crude. rough, very crude method, and that's why they came up with the, the clock system instead. And and so we don't exactly have the ability to throw a rope out behind a spacecraft and measure how it's moving relative to the doesn't actually exist ether of space. Right. So so if only the ether existed. That would <laughs> that would be be so easy. But this is where Doppler shifting is super useful. So we can look at what is the frequency shift in that signal that we're getting from the spacecraft. And, and the other thing is we can actually refine our position by receiving that signal a couple of different places and say, if, if we have a circular planet Earth, okay, this receiver over on this one side of the Earth, it's getting this Doppler shifted component. This receiver over on this other place on the Earth is getting a different Doppler shifted component. And that starts to get at what is the velocity in two different dimensions because you know the X and Y components have to add up to be the same for the spacecraft. Since you're in a different position, you're going to see part of that X and part of that Y differently for the two different positions. So, sorry. So, just to sort of go into more detail on this then. So, the, the spacecraft is, or let's say Earth is sending a signal to the spacecraft. The spacecraft receives the signal. It knows the frequency of this signal if both were, I guess, at rest. You know, it knows yeah. how, how, what is the frequency of the signal that's outbound. I guess, you know, it's been calculated beforehand or it's provided as information and then it measures not only or provides the time code but it actually measures the frequency of the signals that are coming towards it and says okay great you know i know what the frequency should be i'm calculating what the frequency is now so i know what my vol my relative velocity is to that signal yes and, and if i can get two signals and calculate the frequency then i can see oh you know, I'm moving a little towards this signal and a little away from that signal. And you can do the math to figure out your exact velocity in this three-dimensional space. Exactly. And, and one way to think of it is if you have a car that is moving straight away from you, you have pure Doppler shift. If you have a car that's moving in front of you as it goes by um, on a road that you're standing on the sidewalk beside, then you have zero Doppler shift when it's straight in front of you. But as that angle changes from being off in the distance where it's close to coming straight at you, but not quite because you're on the sidewalk and not on the road, that angle as it changes, the amount of Doppler shifting changes. And then it happens again as it's moving away. Well, if you have two different people watching at two different points on the sidewalk, they're going to experience the zero uh, Doppler shift of being directly in front of you on the street at different times and at any given moment they're going to see a different frequency shift. Right. Okay. So now we've got distance from the earth. We've got our velocity and we've got a sort of a sense of what our orientation and position is. So does that give us every all the tools that we need to pretty accurately know where we are? Velocity is hard to get complete, right? With our two measurement example, we've now gotten velocity nailed down in two different axes. You really want to have three different points to measure it to get your three-dimensional. So once you get that three-dimensional velocity, measure your three-dimensional and you know where you are, where you're going. And that is the important part for not losing your spacecraft. But beyond not losing your spacecraft, you need to also know all those three-dimensional for where you're getting to and calculate into the future, how's my spacecraft moving into the future and how is the planet I'm going to or the comet or the asteroid, is it moving to the future? Right. And so that is the, I guess that's part of the time component is that with more measurements of of these 
you know, your distance, your velocity in the three dimensions, your orientation, you start to chart this line in space that tells you with greater and greater accuracy where you are along, you know, what your position, essentially you're calculating what your orbit is around whatever body you're orbiting, be it the earth, be it the sun, be it Mars, whatever. And so that's the point that you really, then the, the, the flight controllers really know exactly where that spacecraft is, give it enough time. I mean, it's very similar to finding the asteroids. You know, we talk about how, the, you know, scientists have found some asteroid and we're not sure if it's going to smash into the Earth or not. We just need to take a few more readings and then we'll get a sense of where, of where it is. So same thing, right? Exactly. This. And the, one of the things that is a problem with asteroids, but not a huge problem with asteroids, is you have to worry about what our gravitational interactions are going to have with other bodies. So is going to randomly yank around smaller asteroids that get too close. We also have to worry about with spacecraft as they approach other bodies, how is that gravity going to affect their motion? Um, so we have to think about spacecraft has its own engines, its own thrusters, and we can use those to change its velocity. But then gravity is out there exerting this constant force. I'm going to push you. Well, pull, actually. And so the sun is out there just yanking away on the spacecraft. The planets, when you get too close, yanking away on the spacecraft. And this is useful when we use gravity to change the orbits of spacecraft. But all the things you have to keep track of, you have to know where you are, when you are, where you're going, and what extra forces the universe is going to add to your journey. So let's talk about, about how then the flight controllers will try to modify. I mean, it's, it's one thing to know where you are and, and where you're going, but what you really want to do is, is be able to go to different places. And so how do they then make their, like what kinds of calculations, what do they do to be able to then change a spacecraft's orientation? Well, if, if you're in an orbit around a, a simple body, so a satellite orbiting the Earth, for instance, then if you know the where you are and the how fast you're going, that will allow you to figure out the rest of your orbit, more or less. You want more than one reading just because things change, errors happen. And then to change your orbit, you figure out where in the orbit you need to change your velocity to get the effect you want. So, for instance, if you launch into a where you're coming down to maybe low Earth orbit, 300 miles up at your closest approach, zipping out to 10,000 miles out on your further approach. If you want to circularize that orbit, you either have to slow yourself down when you're at that closest approach so that you don't zip back out and then you end up with a tiny circle. So you can go from far out to circularized close in, meet up with the space station. But if you want to circularize yourself out further out, you speed yourself up on that further out point. So you stay out in the outer part. We uh, talk about the V. Yeah. So, I mean, everything I've learned, I've really learned from uh, the Kerbal Space Program. And uh, what's really great about that program is, is this – you start to realize, you see how everything is just these orbits, right? They're all ellipses. And so your spacecraft is just following some circular orbit or some elliptical orbit around some body and just goes around and around and around and around. And then if you want to go somewhere else, like say you want to go from the earth to the moon, you don't just point your spacecraft at the moon and just fire your thrusters. I guess if you had unlimited fuel, you could kind of do that. But what you do instead is that you calculate the new orbit that you want to get to, you calculate your insertion orbit, and then it's going to say, you know, it's going to come back and say, okay, great. So now you need to orient yourself in this direction and you need to burn your thrusters for a certain amount of time until you've reached this new orbit. And sometimes once you've reached the sort of the top part of the orbit, you then need to turn around and do a different burn to stabilize the orbit into the new position. And that's just to get yourself to where you can and do it in orbital insertion. And so going back to what you talked about, like once you know where you are, where you're going, what your speed is, then you can make those calculations for the orbital burn that's then going to put you into the new, the new position that you want to be in. And one of the things that always amazes me is 
it's it's relatively easy to start calculating in the grand scheme of the universe the how much delta v you need in order to move from one orbit to another but where it starts to get tricky is when you make that delta v you're also changing the mass of your spacecraft so now the kind of delta v that you need to put in it it's you'll get a different delta v with a different amount of force depending on if you're heavy or light so the amount of firing you need to get that I'm 100 kilometers per whatever unit of time is relevant change in velocity if you're full up on fuel is going to take a whole lot more fuel if you're lightweight it takes a whole lot less weight a whole lot less force and this is what we saw in the Martian he knew what Delta V he needed to get but he knew his spacecraft was too heavy for the amount of fuel he had to get him that Delta V so if they could remove it they removed it make it smaller you require less force for the same delta v right uh so are we at a place now i mean you talk about the deep space network are we at a pl place now where the spacecraft like there is some kind of navigational system that's just going on across all the spacecraft in the solar system if you know, like I, I just imagine is there like a GPS version of of the spacecraft orienting themselves in the solar system? Or is it still fairly early days on this? It's it's not early days, but it's not GPS. It might be safe to say we're in the early 80s. We, we have plenty of receivers on the Earth. It becomes fairly simple to catch the signals that we need to. Mars, we have a bazillion happy little rovers on the surface, by which I mean two. And, and those are great for sending signals back and forth from the things orbiting Mars, uh, getting better positions for both things on the surface and in space. We're getting there. Uh, we don't have the global network we might like that allows everything to be tracked absolutely all the time. There's just not enough dishes. So we take turns. And we hope things don't stray too far between when their turn comes up on the deep space network. So then can you imagine going into the future, uh, like think about the expanse, you know, I don't know if you've watched the expanse yet. It's awesome. If you haven't already, um, I, you know, I can imagine a few hundred years down the road when we do have a colony on Mars, when we do have, you know, someone has hollowed out asteroids just as expected by Dr. Pamela Gay, that we've got these spacecraft buzzing around, mining different worlds. What would a future navigational infrastructure look like here in our solar system? It, it's going to be a land of transponders. The uh, you walk into a room, you see the holographic display where everything is saying, I'm this distance from this, I'm this distance from this. And we'll probably want to have some fixed points that we work very hard with lasers to make sure that they are our standard reference frame, just like we have the GPS around the Earth as a standard reference frame. So you can imagine that there are at various points spacecraft that are sitting there going, I know exactly where I am. I know exactly where I am. And those are the things that become our solar system wide GPS as they orbit the sun instead of orbiting our earth. So I'm, I'm sort of imagining that there's like almost like buoys, like when you're on the yes. ocean, there's all these marker buoys and they're mostly like there's rocks over here. So be careful um, because, you know, we just use the GPS when we're navigating on the, on the ocean, but I can kind of imagine there are these asteroids and moons and obviously earth and places like that. And each one's going to have some transponder that maybe can broadcast in, in a wider field, right? It's not directing right at your spacecraft. It's instead, Maybe doing something that's that's sending out a signal in in all directions, and then you're just you're just counting up how many different transponders that you can get all at the same time, and then you know you're able to get a signal from six different transponders, and so you can calculate your position, and then you know oh we want to get into orbit around Phobos, we're going to need, and then you calculate the burn, right? Exactly, that that is very much the future that we're looking at, and what's amazing is how much we'll learn about things as simple as 
what are the densities of different asteroids as we're able to see interactions with things flying past each other and we measure their exact sizes better, how we're going to be able to get at the fine details of orbital interactions over time as we see, oh, this transponder is a one hundredth of a second off of where we expect it to be. That means there's some interaction that occurred. We're going to learn so much more about the densities of the rocks in our solar system as we drop radio transmitters on them one by one, year after year after year. Right. And eventually we will have probably a transponder on every object out above there. Above a certain size. Above a certain size. And not to mention a bunch of just artificial ones placed in in spots that we've created just to help if if it's not, you know, if there's a big wide space or, or whatever. So uh, it's it's pretty exciting to think about that that sort of future because it means that we've become a true solar system spanning civilization. It, it's an, yes, and and what's awesome is all it takes to keep refining that is to use shorter and shorter wavelengths of light until, well, we know where things are within nanometers. That's amazing. So next next uh, episode, we're going to be talking about a similar idea, but how would we scale this up to to navigating outside of the solar system? So we're going to sort of move into science fiction land. I'm, I'm really excited. Cool. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Pamela. Sounds great, Fraser. All right. And I think the moral of the story was campus internet failed us. Yeah, it really did. Okay. But, you know, I'll I was able to get this. the gist of it and... Uh, and then, and because you're recording locally, it shouldn't be a problem. Right. Okay. I will go home. Okay, cool. I'm just going to save. So we're not going to have time for conversation today, but we're going to, uh, we'll stick around after 414 and, and chat a bit as well, because right. we're going to test out some new tricks and techniques as part of that. So stay that tuned. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll see you all. Uh, we start the Weekly Space Hangout in about an hour, and uh, we'll see you then. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.